Okay, thank you everyone for joining us back here. Um, before we start off with our first panel, um, I just wanted to let you know how we plan on running these panels. We have three speakers on each. Um, I will introduce each of them before they speak, um, around 15, 20 minutes. Um, after the third speaker, we're gonna open it up for a question and answer session. Um, if you'd like, you could go over to the microphone here and state your name and ask a question, or you could stay in your seat and just raise your hand and speak loud so we can hear you. Um, our first panel today is what if science and nuclear weapons. Um, we're gonna hear scenarios of what if the bomb goes off, the health and environmental effects that can happen from this, as well as information on the disclosure of research and issues behind nuclear weapons and accountability aspects as well. Our speakers today are Ira Helfand, He's co-founder of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Hans Christensen, Director of Nuclear Information Project of the American Federation of Scientists. And Nicholas Roth, Program Director for the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. Our first speaker today, Dr. Ira Helfand. He is co-founder and past president of Phys Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is the US affiliate for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War which received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. He also served as International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War as their North American Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and currently Deputy Speaker of International Council. <coughs> Excuse me, Council. He is a leading expert on consequences of what would happen if a nuclear weapon were to be used. He has worked for the US Public Health Service, Department of Ener Emergency Medicine, served as Vice President and President of Medical Staff, at Cooley Dickinson Hospital and Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine. He has several publications and papers focusing on this topic, including Radiation and Health, Nuclear Weapons, and Nuclear Power. Um, he has recently represented both Physicians for Social Responsibility and the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War at the Nobel Peace Prize Ceremony in Norway, and had a recent opinion piece on CNN this past December. A part of that piece caught my attention when I read it. Make no mistake, the elimination of nuclear weapons is an attainable goal. These bombs are not some force of nature. They are the work of our hand. We built them and we can take them apart. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ira Helfand. Good morning. Um, you're gonna be hearing uh, today from a number of very eminent experts on what we need to do uh, to get rid of nuclear weapons, the, the treaties, the, the legal aspects, the political aspects. My job this morning is a little bit simpler, and it's simply to tell you what happens if these efforts fail. Uh, and I want to describe for you uh, the medical consequences of nuclear war. At first look, this might seem like an unnecessary task. I mean, every reasonable person knows that nuclear war would be very, very bad. Um, and we often encounter people saying, you know, we don't need to hear about this stuff. We know that, that this is going to be a terrible thing. But the fact of the matter is that it has been the constant experience of phys members of Physicians for Social Responsibility for the last three to four decades that people do not understand how bad a nuclear war would be. Um, during their 80s, at a time of great uh, fear of nuclear war, there was a broader understanding of these issues. A lot of people did become quite familiar with the medical consequences of nuclear war. But since then, an entire generation has grown up, uh, which knows really has never been exposed to this material. And many people of my generation who lived with this a lot in the 80s uh, have forgotten about it. Uh, it's been put out of mind. Uh, we've acted as though the nuclear weapons went away when the Cold War ended, as indeed they should have, but they didn't. Um, and we just don't think about this anymore. And, and I have to say, it's not just the general public that doesn't tend to think about the medical consequences. Even people who are deeply engaged in work to eliminate nuclear weapons, push this information out of their minds. Um, it, in a sense, it's an adaptive and useful maneuver. It makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. This is terribly painful stuff to think about. But by pushing this data out of our conscious mind, we deprive ourselves of the sense of urgency which we need to bring to this endeavor, the elimination of nuclear weapons. And so I want to talk to you about this stuff this morning. It's not very pleasant to talk about, but I think it's very important. Um, and I want to start by talking about something which has gained increasing uh, attention in, in recent years, which is the consequences of a limited nuclear war. We've known for a long time that a general war between the United States and Russia would be a global catastrophe, something which had effects far beyond their own borders. What we are now understanding is that even a much more limited war would also have global consequences. 
Um, this is just um, a picture um, to go along with the eloquent description of Hiroshima that, that Jonathan Granoff shared with us earlier. Um, this is what a city looks like uh, after it's been hit by a nuclear weapon. In the event that there were a war in South Asia, we have known for some time that there would be terrible consequences locally. Uh, most importantly, something in the order of 20 to 30 million people would be killed directly by the blast and heat of the nuclear explosions if the weapons in the Pakistani and Indian arsenals were used against each other's cities. But what I want to focus on this morning is not this horrible disaster. And, and, and to put this in perspective, 20 to 30 million people dying in the course of a couple of days is basically like World War II being compressed into a couple of days. There were about 50 million deaths worldwide during that conflict. We would see something on the same order of magnitude occurring in a number of days. But this isn't the problem. The problem that we really need to pay attention to is what would happen globally. Because we do know something about the climate effects that nuclear weapons would cause. And what we have learned in the last few years through the work of people like Alan Robach and Brian Toon and their colleagues is that even this limited nuclear war in South Asia, 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs being used in total, less than a half of a percent of the nuclear arsenal of the world, would generate global climate effects that would be devastating. Uh, the burning of the great cities of South Asia would loft something like five teragrams, that's five million metric tons, of soot and other debris into the upper atmosphere, where it would cut down on sunlight coming down onto the planet. And it would cause, within a few days, significant global cooling, an effect that would take place worldwide. The average fall in temperature would be about 1.3 degrees centigrade, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. Um, but if we look at what has happened in the last 130 years with global warming, it, it, it comes into perspective. Um, if I do this right. Um, this blue line shows the total warming that has taken place since 1880 to the present. And you can see that it's about a half a degree centigrade. This conflict in South Asia in a matter of days would cause this drop in temperature. More than double what has happened. I'll try. Sorry. Um, is that better? Yep. It, remind me if I move away from it, please. Um, this... Um, red line shows this stark decline that would take place in a matter of days. And in accompanying this cooling would be a significant decline over the ensuing months in precipitation across the planet, about a 10% decline in precipitation. These effects would last not just for one year, as was thought previously when this issue was looked at back in the 1980s, but the newer computer models that have been used and the uh, more sophisticated uh, climate models that have been used over the last couple of years show that this effect would persist, as the graph shows, for 10 years. Um, and this would have devastating consequences for agriculture worldwide. Um, we cannot predict with certainty exactly what the decline in agricultural production would be. No one has yet done these studies. But we do know from previous cooling experiences that it would be significant. Um, the growing season would be shortened for anywhere from 10 to 20 days over the, the most important grain growing areas in Eurasia and North America. Um, and um, the decline in precipitation, uh, while about 10% worldwide, would be more intense in these same areas, as much as a 30 to 40% decline in precipitation, again, in the critical grain growing areas in uh, Europe, Central Asia, and in North America. Um, there have been some previous natural cooling experiences that we can look to for some guidance on this. Uh, the most uh, heavily studied was, it took place in uh, 1815, which is known as the year without a summer, excuse me, 1816. Um, this uh, was a period of global cooling that followed the eruption of a volcano in, um, in Indonesia the year before. Uh, when the Tambora eruption took place, the drop in temperature was about seven-tenths of a degree, about half of what we would see in the event of a nuclear war. And it did not last as long because the debris was not lofted as high into the atmosphere as would take place with a nuclear war. Um, what happened as a result of this relatively small decline in temperature was significant disruption of agriculture. Uh, in the northeastern part of the United States, where this was looked at very closely, the temperatures on average weren't necessarily that much lower. And in fact, there were days during the summer when there were perfectly normal temperatures. But there were four killing frosts during the summertime. 
uh, one in, uh, two in June, one in July, and one in August. And these completely disrupted crop production. Uh, the price of grain more than doubled, making it inaccessible to large numbers of people. They simply couldn't afford to buy it. Um, and there was significant hunger. Because of the relatively low density of population in North America, there was not widespread starvation here. There was in Europe, uh, and there was in India and in Egypt. And uh, so we know that even an event of this magnitude can cause significant declines in agricultural production and hunger. Um, in the event of a nuclear war, there would be several other very important effects in addition to cooling and drying that would tend to lower agricultural production. Uh, one is that we know that this would also uh, disrupt, uh, this kind of a nuclear conflict would disrupt the ozone level at high altitudes, allowing much more ultraviolet light to get through to the surface of, of the Earth. And that disruption of ozone and increased UV light would also cause significant declines in agricultural production. A lot of major grain crops are very sensitive to UV light, and their yields would be lowered. Uh, in addition, we would expect um, that significant amounts of grain might be diverted to make up for any shortfalls in petroleum. We already see today the diversion of significant amounts of corn uh, to ethanol production. And in the event that a nuclear war caused a disruption in, in international traffic in petroleum, that uh, tendency would be uh, intensified. Um, furthermore, the decline in available petroleum would have very significant direct effects on agriculture. Modern agriculture is enormously dependent on petroleum for pesticides, for, for uh, fertilizer, and to power the tools, the tractors, the, uh, all the kinds of equipment, the, the um, uh, water pumps that are essential to modern agriculture. So there are these other effects beyond cooling that would also come into play in a modern uh, uh, cooling event of this type. Um, we are at this moment extremely ill-prepared to deal with the decline in global food production. There are approximately 800 million people to, actually the most recent estimate this past January was up to a billion people in the world who live at the border of starvation on a day-to-day -day basis. In this group, some 5 million people, mainly children, actually die every year from starvation. This entire group of people would be at risk in the event of a cooling event. Um, we know that it does not require uh, a large decline in agricultural production to produce famine. The most closely studied famine in world history was the Great Bengal Famine in 1943, which is the subject of uh, the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen's seminal work on, on uh, this subject. And what he showed was that the agricultural uh, production in Bengal that year was only about 5% less than the average of the preceding years. And in fact, it was 13% higher than it had been two years earlier. But what happened that year was the Japanese had occupied Burma, which had traditionally supplied food to Bengal in times of crisis. And because of, of the drought and the occupation of Burma, there was a panic. And that's what triggered the famine. People started hoarding food, and the price of food rose fivefold. And so even though there was a fair amount of food around, people couldn't buy it. They couldn't feed their families. And this is exactly what we would expect to happen in the event of a regional nuclear war that caused a decline in food production there would be a huge increase in the price of food worldwide, and there would be global hoarding. Countries that normally export food would stop doing that. And so a relatively small decline in agricultural production, I believe, would put the entire billion people in the world who are on the brink of starvation today at risk. It would also put at risk several hundred million people who live today in countries where there is, on a day-to-day -day basis, adequate food intake, but which are dependent for that food on imports. Uh, North Africa, the Middle East, the industrial countries of East Asia like China, excuse me, like uh, Malaysia and uh, Korea and Japan and Taiwan, they all have enough food today, but they import their food. And so that they also would be put at risk. And I believe that we have to believe that a limited war in South Asia would not only be a catastrophe for the people in the great cities of South Asia who would die directly from the nuclear explosions, but it would lead to a global famine that could kill up to a billion people. These findings have immense implications for nuclear policy. They have implications for the policy of the South Asian countries, of other smaller nuclear powers who have it within their power to create this kind of destruction. They also have Im huge implications for US nuclear policy because even the most extreme reductions in the US arsenal, which are now talked about, would still leave in our arsenals more than enough nuclear weapons to produce this kind of global disaster. But as bad as this is, it really is not the big problem. The big problem remains the prospect, the possibility of a major war between the superpowers. 
between the United States and Russia. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes as well. And I want to start by talking a little bit about what actually happens to a city that's attacked by a nuclear weapon. Um, uh, Jonathan gave us some, I think, very compelling eyewitness descriptions of what happened at Hiroshima, but also noted that the Hiroshima bomb is very small compared to the weapons in the arsenals of the world today. I, I want to talk to you about what happens when a city gets hit with a 20 megaton bomb. Now, there are not weapons of this size in the world today. There were back in the 60s. Uh, since then, we have modernized our forces, and a modern attack on New York City, which I'm going to talk about, would involve not one 20 megaton bomb, but perhaps 15 or 20 or more half megaton bombs or somewhat smaller bombs. The total megatonnage would be somewhat less than one 20 megaton bomb. The destruction would actually be greater because it would be spread out more efficiently over the metropolitan area, and even more people would die, and even more destruction would take place. But it's very hard to describe a whole bunch of bombs going off all at once, so I'm going to use as a model a single 20 megaton explosion. Within one one thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to more than 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun. And everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the earth itself would be vaporized. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the blast pressures would exceed 25 pounds per square inch, and winds generated by the explosion would exceed 650 miles per hour. Mechanical forces of this magnitude destroy anything that human beings can build, including underground structures, uh, bunkers, which are collapsed by these pressures. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobile sheet metal would melt. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, the winds would still be in excess of 200 miles per hour, the blast pressures more than 10 pounds per square inch. Forces of that magnitude destroy almost everything that we built. A building like this, which is concrete and steel, would probably just have all the windows blown out. But a frame house, a simple masonry house, would be totally leveled. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, please note that the scale, oops, excuse me, the scale just had to change on this to accommodate this. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, and this is perhaps the most important point, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Wood, paper, cloth, heating oil, gasoline, it all ignites. Hundreds of thousands of fires uh, are created, and they all merge into a giant firestorm. Um, 32 miles across, 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature rises to more than 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, and every single living thing dies. All the oxygen is consumed. There is nothing left. In an attack on New York, this would mean something in the order of 15 million people would die within the first half hour or so as this firestorm took, sh took shape. And if this attack were part of an all-out attack on the United States, this kind of destruction that I have talked to you about would be shared by every single major metropolitan area in the United States. A study that we did in 2002 showed that if only 500 of the warheads in the Russian arsenal detonated over American cities, in the first 30 minutes, something like 90 million people would die. In addition, the entire infrastructure that the rest of us depend on for survival, the economic infrastructure, the communications infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, would be destroyed. And in the coming months, those of us who survived the initial attack would almost all certainly die from exposure, from starvation, from epidemic disease. And this destruction would also be visited on Russia if the United States responded to this attack in kind. But again, as horrible as these direct effects are, they are not the problem. The problem is the climate disruption that's caused, because the same phenomena that I talked about in South Asia also take place in the event of a large-scale war, but on a much greater scale. Um, in the event that all of the major weapons in the US and Russian strategic arsenals get drawn into a conflict, the temperature drops not 1.3 degrees centigrade on average, but 10 degrees centigrade on average, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Temperatures of that level have not been seen on this planet in 20,000 years since the coldest part of the last ice age. Uh, the effect is not even. Again, uh, in the major grain growing areas in Central uh, Asia and in Europe and in North America, the temperature declines are much greater, up to 15 to 30 degrees centigrade. For the, these uh, declines in temperature would persist for up to 10 years, and for at least three years, throughout all of the major grain growing areas in the Northern Hemisphere, there would not be a single day free of frost. That means that agriculture would stop. There would be no food production. Ecosystems would collapse. And many, many species, including perhaps our own, would become extinct. I want you to look at this very simple, very crude clip. This shows the soot from this war between the United States and Russia as it disperses over the course, over the, the surface of the planet. What you are looking at is the end of the world. There's no other way to describe this. This shroud kills us all. And again, it is particularly important that we understand that this is not just some theoretical possibility. War between the United States and Russia remains at this moment a real and present danger. I would say an imminent danger. Jonathan spoke earlier about the events of January 25th, 1995. I want to go back to those for just a minute because I think they have enormous implications for us. We have tended to act, and certainly the arms control community has tended to act, as though the problem is simply proliferation to countries like Iran and North Korea. And this is certainly very dangerous. But we have to understand that the great threat to all of our survival is a threat posed by the enormous arsenals which the United States and Russia continue to maintain and will maintain even under the START Treaty that is being negotiated today. We, we act and people in government act as though the use of these weapons is simply not on the table. It can't happen. We're not about to have a war with Russia. But we saw on January 25th, 1995 that we could have a war with Russia. That incident brought us to within five minutes of the kind of destruction which I have just talked to you about. And it is important that we remember that January 25th was a perfectly normal day. January 25th, 1995, there were no major crises any place in the world that day. The United States had not invaded Iraq. September 11th hadn't taken place. We were not in Afghanistan. The North Koreans had not tested their nuclear weapons yet. The, um, Indians and the Pakistanis had not tested their nuclear weapons yet. We were not engaged in a tense standoff with Iran about their nuclear pro programs. It was a good day, and we came within five minutes of blowing up the whole world. And the conditions which allowed that to possibly take place pertain today. The weapons are still on hair trigger alert. They can be launched in 15 minutes, and the same kind of mistake that almost cost us our planet on that day 15 years ago, those conditions still exist. It could happen today, and we live in a much more dangerous moment. So this is the threat that we face. And I think this is the information which we all have to hold very much in our minds. It's horrible. It's painful. We don't like it. And we have to do it anyway. It's like when you talk to somebody who smokes cigarettes, and you just drive home to them all the horrible things that these cigarettes are going to do to them. And they don't want to hear it. But they have to if they're going to stop smoking. In the same way, we have to hold this information front and center in our consciousness if we're going to approach the task of nuclear disarmament with the urgency that it requires. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to if you want to remember your question after our last speaker is done, be happy to come back that would be great. The the Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Helfand. Oh, <laughs> um, our next speaker is Hans Christensen. He is the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. There he provides the public with analysis and background information about the status of nuclear forces and the role of nuclear weapons. He specializes in using the Freedom of Information Act in his research and is a frequent consultant too and is widely referenced in the news media. 
He is the co-author of the Nuclear Notebook column in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in the World's Nuclear Forces Overview in the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute yearbook. The Nuclear Notebook is, according to the publisher, widely regarded as the most accurate source of information on nuclear weapons and nuclear, <clears throat> excuse me, nuclear facilities available to the public. His publications um, are available online if you'd like to read them. Between 2002 and 2005, he was a consultant to the nuclear program at the Natural Resources Defense Council in Washington, D.C. There, he researched nuclear weapons issues and wrote the report, U.S. Nuclear Weapons in Europe, including, what's, um, including articles, What's Behind Bush's Nuclear Cuts and the Protection Paradox. Between 98 and 2002, he directed the Nuclear Strategy Project at the Nautilus Institute in Berkeley, California and he was a special advisor to the Danish Ministry of Defense in 1997 to 1998 as a member of the Danish Defense Commission. He was a senior researcher with the Nuclear Information Unit of Greenpeace International in Washington, D.C. from 91 to 96. His work on U.S. nuclear policy in 2005 um, led to the disclosure that preemptive nuclear strikes were being incorporated into U.S. post-Cold War joint nuclear doctrine for the first time. This, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this disclosure triggered political reactions from Russia, Germany, and North Korea. In the United States, it led to the Senate Armed Services Committee to request briefings from the Pentagon and 16 senators to write President Bush asking him to intervene. Ladies and gentlemen, Hans Christensen. Good thing I'm not in charge of the nuclear war plan. <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, the invitation to come up and uh, talk about these important issues. And uh, I'm somewhat still in shock over the previous presentation um, because it's true. Uh, even though, as uh, I do myself, I sit and work on these numbers and strategies and weapons and all these things all the time. We forget what it's all about, uh, or tend to, and uh, so that's a very important reminder. And so what I want to talk about on the what-if agenda here today is suppose the Obama administration did change U.S. nuclear policy. What would be the effect on the strategic war plan? That plan is what it's all about, because that's what the adversaries see. It's what they plan against. It's what they fear. It's what's supposed to deter them, uh, and what have you. But it's also one of the most secret documents in, in America. It, the public generally uh, does not know anything about it. Very few people in the White House and the Congress have ever seen this plan. Yet it's what our thousands of nuclear weapons are uh, maintained according to. Um, we've seen some uh, strong pledges and promises being made uh, by uh, President Obama. Uh, first in, in Prague, where he talks about putting an end to Cold War thinking. And uh, by reducing not only the role or the number, not only the, the numbers of weapons, but also the role. Uh, this was repeated just very recently, um, where he, uh, in, in a letter to uh, the Global Zero Summit in, in Paris, uh, reiterated that. Um, that a nuclear posture review that is currently underway in the administration will reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons. And that's good news. Uh, to see uh, what they'll come up with, we'll have to see that I think the review is supposed to release, be released on March the 1st. However, the Clinton and Bush administrations also talked about reducing the role and numbers of nuclear weapons. And for various reasons, uh, rightly or wrongly, they were seen as, in fact, increasing the, or broadening the role of nuclear weapons. Um, I'll explain a little of that later, but it does raise this question of how will the Obama administration's approach to this be different? Um, current declaratory policy for what our nuclear weapons uh, um, are supposed to do and, and when we would use it is sometimes hard to find. Uh, but it's something that our government communicates deliberately to other countries uh, through public statements, for example. Um, this one from 2008 uh, is one in which we talk about 
the, the right to respond with overwhelming uh, force to the use of weapons of mass destruction. And it's something that relates both to countries that have weapons of mass destruction, but also sort of the, the lower category, if you will, of, of non-state actors in, in association with the, with the uh, states that have weapons of mass destruction. Many of these policies and, and, and languages have become intertwined very much after 9-11, and it can be hard to see where is the borderline between when they talk about nuclear and when they talk about non-nuclear. So where could the administration reduce the role? Well, if you take this particular uh, statement as declaratory policy, there are several places that I've highlighted with red here, which would have an effect on the war plan if they changed some of that. Um, of course, the first one is the in response to uh, the use of weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction is a very broad category of, of uh, terrible weapons. Um, it goes beyond nuclear. It also includes chemical, biological, radi radiological weapons as well. Um, so if you have that in your declaratory policy as the mission for nuclear weapons, that means that the military is planning their strike plans against targets that involve these types uh, of weapons. It's a much broader range of targets than, um, than just nuclear. The other one is that, who, are, who is this about that we're protecting? Our forces, our, uh, ourselves of course, our forces, and our friends and allies. The friends is a very vague term. Um, the allies, pretty easy to find out. We have signed treaties with them. It's normally a longstanding uh, a relationship that's very close. Friends is quite diffuse, and so if we're talking about where is our role, where, where do we envision that our nuclear weapons could potentially uh, be brought to use, um, we're talking about many different types of scenarios in, if we just uh, limit it to uh, ourselves, our forces, and our allies. So that's another example where you could change it. And of course this whole other section about non-state actors either acting alone uh, but, or in, uh, in collusion with uh, uh, another weapon state. Um, that's another element where there could be uh, changes. Now, again, the way we talk about the role of nuclear weapons very much defines um, how the military plans for it. Um, but the discussion about the role for nuclear weapon is not always very clear about this uh, at all. Uh, for example, when I talked about weapons of mass destruction before, that terminology sort of crept in to our nuclear language literally overnight back in the early 1990s. Before that, the role of nuclear weapons was to deter nuclear attack and large conventional attacks like the Soviet Union inv invading, uh, invading Europe. But because of proliferation and what we discovered in Iraq, um, suddenly the term was weapons of mass destruction. Likewise, when we talk about we are going to respond with overwhelming force to the use of, how dynamic do we need our nuclear planning to be in order to be able to sufficiently deter potential um, aggression? Well. I've, I've set up some words here because you can see if we talk about deter and prevent, well, that's, that's a, deter is a very broad uh, terminology. What does that mean? I mean, you can, you can deter with all sorts of uh, uh, means and situ scenarios and situations. Uh, prevent is a very particular word uh, that talks about essentially prevention. Uh, you, you preempt someone from using their, uh, their weapons uh, simply uh, by destroying them before they can use, be used. D deter, as I mentioned, very broad. Respond to, vague, again, uh, but it's much less proactive, if you will. Uh, it, it, it signals uh, a less aggressive posture uh, than the, the deter and prevent. If you talk about retaliate, well, now we're getting close to a non, no first use policy, but it's not called that. Retaliate means that you will respond with these weapons if someone attacks us first. Um, and of course, no first use uh, says it outright. It's very constrained, but is it credible? Do people believe in a no first use policy? That's the other issue. Um, we put out a study recently uh, called From Counterforce to Minimal Deterrence, in which we 
uh, discuss and analyze some of these issues and argue for moving away from what's currently called a counter-force posture, where we focus our military planning for nuclear weapons against the destruction of other military forces, um, to something we call the minimal deterrence, which is a much more relaxed and uh, less preoccupied with war fighting and more focused on deterrence, if you will. Now, the trend, we heard about the enormous impact of nuclear weapons. The trend in the U.S. stockpile, this is just the U.S. side of it, <laughs> and um, you have to imagine a, up in the 1990s, a very large uh, a Soviet uh, stockpile as well. But here I have plotted what the total U.S. stockpile has looked like over the years, the total inventory that the Department of Defense has of nuclear weapons. And uh, the red uh, curve underneath it is how many of those weapons were loaded on our strategic forces, offensive forces, those that can fly across the Atlantic and Pacific and hit uh, other continents far away. And it's only a smaller portion. And the reason is that in the first part, most overwhelmingly, most of our weapons were uh, tactical nuclear weapons for battlefield use, uh, fighting nuclear wars in the regions. And later on, that kind of emphasis died out, if you will, and there was more emphasis put on strategic weapons later on in, in this history phase. And you can also see where nuclear posture reviews have fallen in the last uh, year since 1994. Those reviews where we're now waiting for the 2010 uh, to determine where uh, should we end up. But you can see we're back to a posture in terms of force structure that, that reminds us pretty much of you know, where we were back in the mid-1950s, 1906, early 1960, in terms of numbers, but in terms of capability, there is no, no comparison. It's an extraordinarily development. Um, current U.S. stockpile, or arsenal, inventory of nuclear weapons uh, today is a totally around 4,500, um, but only a portion of those are actually in the Department of Defense stockpile. We heard about the effect of what a few hundred nuclear weapons can do. We have 5,000 in our military stockpile currently that are, of which um, about 2,600 are deployed, 2,600 weapons deployed under active war plans that are operational, ready to use. And of those weapons, probably about a thousand, just below a thousand, are on high alert, ready to fly. Uh, in the case of the land-based missile force, within three to four minutes from the orders given, and on the strategic submarines, uh, in about 12 minutes. Um, these are the numbers that will be affected by the nuclear post review, and also by the arms control agreement with Moscow, the START treaty. How deep? We don't know. Uh, there's a general idea under the START agreement to go to a level of what's known as 1500 to 1675 operationally deployed strategic warheads. That part of it only relates to one small portion of the stockpile. This number right there, the 2100 number. Everything else is not affected by that arms control agreement. And so, what arms controllers, negotiators are really hoping to get to after this treaty is something else that's beginning to look at all the other stuff. The nuclear posture review will make decisions about modernizations in the nuclear stockpile. Uh, what I hear is that we have a triad of bombers, land-based missiles, sea-based missiles in our strategic arsenal. That's called a triad. There were th some talks about perhaps cutting one of those legs, but as far as I hear, that's not going to happen. They're going to continue to have a triad. Um, we will have a strategic submarine force where they will decide to build a new generation of them. Um, the first of 12 new strategic submarines are expected around 2019, and that's a $60 billion project. It will be equipped probably with a new type of ballistic missile. Uh, we will probably extend the life of the uh, Minuteman, uh, for, Minuteman uh, ICBM, the land-based, long-range uh, long ballistic missiles on land. We'll build a new long-range bomber to replace the ones we currently have, and it will have nuclear capability. There is a new nuclear cruise missile in the Obama administration's uh, nuclear budget for 2009 and, and looking outward. Uh, 
There's a new fighter bomber, the, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, F-35, which uh, most likely will get nuclear capability. Um, there is the issue of what's called the TLAM-N, which is the nuclear-armed Tomahawk uh, cruise missile launched from submarines, whether that will be retained or retired. There's been some talks about allied countries very much wanting that weapon as a protection against all sorts of things, but uh, I think it will be retired or at least be allowed to uh, phased out. And of course, then the uh, um, weapons production itself. Not necessarily new weapons, but modernized weapons. Uh, new versions, if you will, of the ones we're already having in stockpile. We have a new life extension program philosophy where we extend the life ex of existing designs, but we can modify them significantly, of course, and build in new capabilities if we want to. Um, there are new bomb factories in the sense of uh, pit production, production of the cores of nuclear uh, weapons that is currently taking place down at Los Alamos Laboratory. They are asking for money to build a factory that can uh, uh, do more of those uh, productions uh, and so forth. All of this comes back to this, which is the strategic war plan. Operations plan 8010, that's our strategic war plan. During the Cold War, it used to be called the PSYOP. That has been changed a lot. This is a slide uh, I got released under the Freedom of Information Act that reveals surprisingly, that in today's war plan, there are six adversaries. During the Cold War, we used to have the Soviet Union and then China as a side chapter in a strategic war plan. Now there are six. And so you, it makes you wonder, well, we thought it was supposed to reduce the role of nuclear weapons instead. We have expanded it into the regions against other countries with weapons of mass destruction. Um, the countries are, I think, uh, of course they're classified as you can see here, Russia, China, North Korea, those are the nuclear weapons countries, if you will. Uh, then there is Iran, Syria, they have weapons of mass destruction, not nuclear necessarily, well they don't have nuclear, not yet, but they have other forms of weapons of mass destruction. And then there's a, the sixth adversary, which was a mystery to me for a long time, and until someone out at Stratcom said, think 9-11. And you know, that has to be something in the order of a dramatic terrorism event uh, where this form of planning is, assumes a role for strategic forces in um, either responding to or trying to deter them. Now, the thing about the regions is very important because, because of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, that was the new expansion that happened during the 19th and the first part of this decade in our nuclear mission. Um, there's now a family of uh, plans uh, against these various countries. This is another slide from another briefing I got from Stratcom. Um, and of course they deleted the names of the countries, <laughs> but they forgot to remove the pictures. So you can see the North Korean launch of a ballistic missile, you can see the Libyan uh, underground storage facility for chemical, uh, and then you can see Scott missiles with their candidates for Iran, Iraq, and Libya. Um, since then, Iraq has moved out of the war plan, of course. Um, uh, Libya also, it has relinquished its weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction program. And so left in the plan from these, this group of countries is uh, uh, Syria and Iran. Now, if the Obama administration reduced the policy to no longer ask the military to plan military, nuclear operations against chemical and biological weapons use. Just focus on the nuclear. The only weapons that can sort of truly uh, destroy us, if you will. Um, what effect would that have? That's the rumor I hear the most out there, that that will be the outcome of it. Uh, we'll have to see. Well, if they did that, then the number of adversaries in the strategic war plan, the component of it that deals with nuclear uh, weapons, would be reduced from, from six to three, back to Russia, China, and North Korea. But it would also mean removing a lot of the targets from the targeted plan. Uh, out at Stratcom, the warfighters are sitting there analyzing targets all the time, updating based on the intelligence updating what types of weapons, with what capabilities, and what scenarios, supposed to cover them and hold them at risk, et cetera. This is a never-ending process. It's happening every day. Um, many of those, uh, much of that workload would be reduced um, from removing those type of scenarios. Um, 
There are many other elements of it. I don't have time to go into them all here, but I'll just end by saying, if we did that, if the nuclear posture, if that is the way we will reduce the role, then they would have an effect on, in terms of the number of adversaries and the number of strike scenarios that are in the nuclear war plan, what the military is asked to plan for. But it would not put an end to Cold War thinking, uh, as Obama has said is his objective. Because this is not Cold War thinking. This is post-Cold War thinking. This was added to the war plan after the Cold War ended. This is what we started to do after proliferation. Cold War thinking is what our military is uh, asked to do against Russia and China. That's where the overwhelming part of the work is going on in terms of the war plan. The, the vast majority of the weapons are allocated, et cetera. That's where the focus is. So if you wanted to reduce uh, 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 Cold War thinking, uh, put an end to Cold War thinking, you will have to change the way uh, we ask the military to plan for not just deterrence, which is a very strange and vague word, but also those particular types of what's known as force-on-force -force scenarios, where we plan to use forces against their nuclear forces in, t in case deterrence fails, and who wins? Well, who wins is the one who's the better, who can knock out the most over there before they're used, et cetera. That type of war planning for nuclear forces is the Cold War thinking. And that's what we'll have to see if that is being reduced. Uh, that would be a big change. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that's where things are heading. I think it'll be a much more modest uh, change in our nuclear policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. Our last speaker on the panel is Nicholas Roth, Program Director um, of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability um, that's based out of Washington, D.C. He has eight years of research and advocacy experience addressing U.S. nuclear policy, history, and nonproliferation. His responsibilities include coordinating legislative activities, conducting issue research, and organizing ANA's annual D.C. Advocacy Days. Prior to going there, Nicholas served as office director for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in Washington, D.C. He also serves as a coordinator for the Peace and Security Community's Young Professionals Working Group and is on the Think Outside the Bomb National Youth Network coordinating the committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicholas Roth. Thank you for uh inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be on, on the panel with, with the other two speakers, and I'm particularly happy to be uh, coming from Washington, D.C., where I'd be eliminated instantly in a, in a giant fireball to a place where um, I'd gradually um, die from starvation and nuclear winter and <laughs> fallout. So um, it's nice to get out of that um, context for a little while. Um, before I start to... Uh, go into the content of my speech, I want to talk a little bit about what the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability is and what we do, because um, I think it will give a lot of context to what I'm going to talk about. The Alliance for Nuclear Accountability is a grassroots um, organization, an umbrella organization for grassroots state and national groups, many of which um, are in communities with nuclear weapons production facilities. So we work not only on um, broad policy arms control issues, but we deal directly with um, the direct impacts of nuclear weapons production and the environmental and health legacy of 60 years of nuclear weapons production. So our take on, on arms control issues uh, extends not only to the threat that um, detonation of nuclear weapons pose, but also to the continuing um, health and environmental impacts on, on people that still persist today. Um, so I'd like to start by just framing where we are right now um, in terms of uh, U.S. policy on nuclear weapons. In April 2009, President Obama um, laid out his administration's plan for nuclear weapons policy and nonproliferation policy. And I think the best way to look at, at the, these policies are two sides of the same coin. On one side of the coin, sort of a bright, shiny, um, new looking coin, you have the vision for a nuclear weapons free world. And the immediate steps of this vision involve 
um, ratification of important treaties that would likely reduce the threat of nuclear weapons, a comprehensive test ban treaty, um, uh, further reductions in the nuclear stockpile, um, perhaps a, a ban on fissile material production. The other side of uh, this coin um, was stated in, in, again in this speech in April 2009, uh, was as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States would maintain a strong nuclear deterrent. Um, at the time, it wasn't quite known what the administration defined as maintaining a strong nuclear deterrent and what um, that, that entailed um, in terms of policy, in terms of funding. In the last month, we've gotten a much better idea of what that plan entails. And essentially, what it means, and we, we have seen this in an op-ed um, that Vice President Biden published um, in, on January 29th of this year, and then again his speech um, uh, yesterday at the National Defense University, um, but also in, in explicit detail in the budget that um, the Obama administration released um, earlier this month. What that plan entails is massive investments in the industrial infrastructure that supports nuclear weapons. And I think it's important that we recognize that nuclear weapons don't just exist in missile silos around the country, that, they're, um, that they don't, a stork doesn't come and just deliver nuclear weapons when we need them. There's a massive industrial uh, complex, it's called the nuclear weapons complex, that not only uh, supports the existence of nuclear weapons, but also potentially um, could create new nuclear weapons. And so the uh, Obama administration's um, other side of the coin, the maintaining the strong nuclear arsenal, um, has to do with massive investments in production facilities um, within this nuclear weapons complex. And so I I'm going to talk about that plan a little bit, um, but I also want to talk about what is the nuclear weapons complex? And I'm going to go through this very quickly um, because I grew up in New York, and most of the all all of the facilities that are currently operational are on the west side, uh, western side of the United States. Um, so, uh, as I'm, well, I'm assuming many of us are East Coasters. It's good to see what does the nuclear weapons complex look like. Um, where do nuclear weapons come from? Um, so, to begin, this is sort of a broad overview of where the facilities um, in the United States exist. Uh, Oak Ridge and Y-12, the Savannah River site, the Kansas City plant, Pantex in Texas, Sandia National Laboratories, um, both in New Mexico and in California, Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico, the Nevada test site, and then Lawrence Livermore Labs. Um, so you get a general uh, overview of where these places exist. Lawrence Livermore Lab is responsible for research and design of nuclear components, um, as well as uh, research of uh, high explosive um, materials and uh, high explosives testing. To give you an idea of um, where this facility sits in the, in the uh, town of Livermore, uh, these are all residential houses uh, right along here. Um, the, my organization's member group, uh, it's called Tri-Valley Cares, is just outside of this photo, but um, the, the woman who runs that organization uh, has a giant radioactive plume underneath her apartment building. So um, it's very real to the people who live there. Um, Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, I've now traveled there twice, once last fall. It's, a, it's a, an entire city basically designed for uh, nuclear weapons research and nuclear weapons production. Um, it's a really bizarre place. It's like going to the Twilight Zone. Uh, the streets are named, uh, some of the streets are named after uh, nuclear tests that were conducted. Other streets are named after nuclear weapon scientists um, that uh, are, um, are, 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 are sort of renowned in, in this community. Um, some of these trees here uh, in, uh, earlier this decade had been eliminated because of a massive forest fire that came to the edge of plutonium production facilities. Um, in the community, so uh, it's a really bizarre place. Um, Kansas City plant, um, where the non-nuclear weapons uh, components are produced, um, it's in Kansas City, Missouri, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, again, massive envir uh, environmental and health impacts from uh, even non-nuclear weapons uh, component production at this location. Um, the Nevada test site, which it's probably more familiar to some people. Uh, these holes here um, are pictures, uh, are, are, are where nuclear weapons uh, tests were conducted. More than a thousand tests were conducted both above 
and below ground um, between 1951 and 1992. If you go to Google Earth, you can get a very good overview and see actual where these, um, where the same sort of photo, but you can see how many of them there are. And these things are, are miles in diameter. I mean, these are, this is a very high, uh, high up photo. Uh, the Pantex plant in Texas, which is responsible for not only um, Disma uh, not disma it's supposed to be dismantling um, excess nuclear warheads, the 4500 that Hans had shown all of you, but what it does more of now is uh, modernization and refurbishment of the existing warheads. Um, Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque um, is responsible for um, uh, research as well, um, in particular the research and design of the non-nuclear components that are produced at the Kansas City plant. Um, and then the Savannah River site, which is where eventually um, disposition of, of excess fissile material will take place. Um, there have been massive investments um, in, in a really bad plan that I'm not going to go into to dispose of, to attempt to dispose of uh, fissile material. And then finally, Oak Ridge in Y12. Um, the Oak Ridge complex is intended to be the uranium center of the United States. Um, all of the uranium components of nuclear weapons are manufactured in Oak Ridge. Um, massive investments, um, according to this, uh, this new plan, will be made in production facilities here as well. So that's sort of an overview of what the nuclear complex is. There used to be more facilities. It's eight facilities now. Um, for instance, one facility in uh, Colorado in Rocky Flats was shut down because they were burning plutonium at night on Fridays and shooting it up into the atmosphere and um, essentially uh, spread plutonium across the city of Denver. So um, in an FBI raid overnight, um, that facility was shut down in 1989. Um, so what's the current plan? Um, the Obama administration's called the new plan for the nuclear weapons complex modernization. Modernization sounds like a good thing. Who can be opposed to modernization? But what Modernization actually entails, modernization is a new word for an existing policy um, that was institutionalized under the Bush administration. And the policy was of a responsive infrastructure. And for those who want to support the nuclear weapons infrastructure um, that I've just shown you, the logic they're, they're, they're trying to sell is as the stockpiles of nuclear weapons states of the United States reduces, um, the strategic importance of the nuclear weapons labs increase. And as the strategic importance of the labs increase, it'll be, more, it'll be important that these labs and these facilities have ramp up capability in, in case there is some unforeseen uh, geopolitical um, threat or some type of scientific uh, or failure in the stockpile. Um, both of these scenarios are have no justification, um, so I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, technically have no justification of failures in the stockpile, and um, at least geopolitically a scenario where we're going to ramp up to have thousands of warheads again is not particularly likely at all. Um, so the increase in the, in the budget that, uh, in the nuclear weapons budget that the Obama administration is proposing, money on its own isn't bad. Um, large increases in nuclear weapons, depending on where they go, aren't they, can, they can be benign. They're not necessarily, um, don't have to be bad things. But in particular, the budget reflected uh, three, um, three particularly concerning um, new production facilities. Um, the first is something called the Chemistry and Metallurgy Research Replacement Nuclear Facility in Los Alamos. Essentially what this facility is designed to do is allow for an increase in plutonium pit production. There's a plutonium pit in every nuclear warhead. Um, for, uh, up to 125 uh, plutonium pits a year. And if uh, one might say if we have a stockpile of four to 5,000 nuclear weapons, 125 plutonium pits may not seem that bad. Um, I would just refer you to Ira's speech about the, uh, the, what 125 nuclear weapons could do. The second portion of this new production capacity is uh, something called the Uranium Processing Facility at Y12. The Uranium Processing Facility is going to replace an existing facility um, that was intended to create uranium uh, components for nuclear weapons, what are called uh, secondaries in, in the uh, nuclear package of the warhead. Um, 
And then the third, uh, and again, this, uh, this facility would have a capability of producing up to 125 uh, uranium secondaries uh, per year. And then the third component of this plan, um, this sort of other side of the coin, is something, is a new, Can uh, new Kansas City plant. Um, the existing Kansas City plant, let me go back to it. Uh, this is the old facility, it's been around since the 1950s. They want to shut it down and there's no real justification other than they want a new facility um, with expanded production capacity. Um, so they want to shut it down um, and, and essentially move to a new location um, without cleaning up the existing site. So all of these plans are sort of being done independently of each other. They're part of one larger plan, but the 125 capacity at uh, uranium production capacity, the 125 uh, plutonium pit produ uh, production capacity at Los Alamos, and then this, uh, this new facility at Kansas City plant, according to those who run the nuclear weapons complex, have the fact that all of them have matching capacity is a coincidence. Um, what it actually means is the United States would be able to produce uranium, plutonium, and non-nuclear components for new warheads um, as soon as these facilities were, re were ready to go in, in, in a place that where we're supposed to be uh, ramping down our numbers and our, and our, production, uh, and our, and our production capacity. Um, I think it's important because this is one of the messages that the administration is putting out to differentiate between the types of investments that are required to maintain the stockpile as we reduce it and maintain the, uh, the stockpile in a safe and reliable and secure way and the types of investments like these that allow for a large ramp up uh, for nuclear weapons production if the policy decision is made to do so. And while the Obama administration has, an, has, explicit, has supported arms reductions and uh, has said they wouldn't be producing new nuclear weapons, that doesn't mean President Palin in eight years is going to feel the same way. Um, and I'll let that sink in for a second. Um, or whoever it might be. Um, and so I, I think it's important from uh, a nonproliferation context, context to look at this production capacity independently from the decision to build new nuclear weapons. Because some administrations may decide we, we don't need nuclear weapons. Hopefully all uh, administrations from now on will decide we don't need to produce nuclear weapons. However, as I stated earlier, the, as the numbers in the stockpiles reduce, the strategic significance of these facilities will increase. And I think it's going to impact nonproliferation and particularly the NPT uh, discussions in three specific ways. And the first has to do with the principle of irreversibility, which I had mentioned, uh, which has been mentioned earlier. Um, in 2000 at the NPT review conference, the United States and the nuclear weapon states uh, agreed to 13 steps towards uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons. One of, one of these steps, um, one of uh, the key steps that's um, seen by the non-nuclear weapon states is that nuclear weapons uh, reductions be irreversible. Irreversibility in this context um, it actually has no, th there's no one definition for how irreversibility is defined. It's sort of evolved over time. Um, the, the, sort, the most common version of irreversibility is referred to in two ways. One is when nuclear weapons are taken off alert status um, or active status that they be dismantled. And then the second way is um, that fissile material production be stopped. However, if you consider that half of, the, half of the importance of irreversibility is the dismantlement of nuclear weapons, having new facilities that assemble nuclear weapons undermines the significance of irreversibility as a step to, um, to, a, a, as a step, um, to eliminating nuclear weapons. This is not only important in the NPT context, but it's particularly important with reduction treaties between Russia and the United States. Russia has repeatedly said that um, as we make deeper and deeper reductions in nuclear stockpiles, irreversibility is going to be a more important, an increasingly important issue. The timetable for these new production facilities, um, if they're built the, on, on schedule, which they typically don't, and they typically don't do them on budget either. Um, around the same time, we should be negotiating deep reductions in uh, 
in nuclear stockpiles between Russia and the United States, um, we're going to have new production facilities going online, um, undermining irreversibility. Um, around 2022 is probably when all of, at the earliest, is when all of these facilities would go online. Um, there are a number of things that would severely hamper uh, future negotiations for deep reductions with Russia. We shouldn't be adding on to that list um, right now. The second serious, um, the second serious implication of these facilities, and I touched on it before, is that these aren't just facilities that are sitting around and aren't going to do anything. The history of the nuclear weapons complex and the history of any type of government project is if that you invest large amounts of capital and if you create momentum to, for a production facility, it's going to be used. So it's fair to say that once these facilities go online, they, there will be a new, uh, they'll, they will find a job for them. Whether that means in, uh, increasing numbers in stockpiles, I don't know, and, and I wouldn't speculate, but certainly around the same time we need to be making deep reductions, new production facilities will go online and will be used in some capacity. And then I think the third problem with this sort of other side of the coin is if the point of these reductions and these treaties and even policy statements is to reduce the salience and legitimacy of nuclear weapons as a means for security, Using, this, uh, using uh, production facilities as a strategic hedge doesn't accomplish that. In fact, it reinforces the idea that nuclear weapons are needed for, uh, for, for, for protection. Um, so just to conclude, um, I'd like to go back to this metaphor of the Obama administration's nuclear policy as a form of currency, as a coin, as a dollar, whatever you may think it is. The nonproliferation policy is supposed to be a form of currency to be used in negotiating with other countries a nonproliferation policy and, and moving towards uh, or nonproliferation, uh, strengthening the nonproliferation regime and reducing uh, the threat posed by nuclear weapons. If one side of the coin is recognizable and, and, and has sort of international treaties and the things that we like, but the other side of the coin is scratched and messed up to the point where it's, un, where, where it's unrecognizable. Is it going to be a legitimate form of currency that we can use in the, in the multilateral context to strengthen nonproliferation and, and delegitimize and, and reduce the threat of nuclear weapons? I don't know the answer. Um, I, my inclination is probably not. Um, that this is not a legitimate nonproliferation policy, that this isn't going to be seen as a, concern, as, as a real effort to reduce um, the, the, the danger posed by nuclear weapons and strengthening the nonproliferation regime. But um, I think we'll, we're going to find out in the, next, uh, in the next few months how the rest of the world perceives this. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, that was incredibly interesting. Um, I know we probably have some questions out there already. Um, sir, did you want to go ahead and ask your question now? Well, uh, a more direct question is something that hasn't even been mentioned. These trillions of dollars, and that's a question in itself, what about the cost, there were nothing about cost. These trillions of dollars could be used to solve a lot of world problems. Doesn't seem to enter the thinking of the syndrome of these people. And secondly, people remind me again, I'm sorry I forgot, I guess many of us have, that fateful day in 1995, but we might have been gone. To speak very quickly to that, um, Jonathan mentioned this in his talk earlier this morning, but on January 25th, 1995, the, the, there was launched from Norway a rocket to study weather phenomenon. Uh, the Russians mistook this initially for an, uh, a, a possible attack on Moscow and activated their uh, response procedures. And the common wisdom is that we came within about five minutes of, of the point in which the Russians would have had to decide if they were going to retaliate. And the decision was being made uh, by Boris Yeltsin, who was a bad alcoholic with a lot of other health problems. And it's kind of scary to think that somebody in that compromised situation 
would be given five minutes to decide if the world continues to exist or not. But that's the way, that's the world that we have created and maintained. Does anybody else ha have questions? Sure. There, uh, there was a report uh, done by a gentleman named Stephen Schwartz uh, in the past year that estimated the total costs that go into uh, maintaining nuclear arsenals and, and the uh, and sort of uh, peripheral programs as well. And that number was around 52 billion dollars. I think it's important when looking at how much nuclear weapons cost to understand that the process to dismantle nuclear weapons and to clean up the environmental and health legacy will also be an enormously expensive uh, endeavor. The, uh, the fiscal liability right now for uh, cleanup of uh, nuclear weapons production at, at the eight sites that I showed you is $200 billion right now and it'll take more than 100 years. Um, so I think it's important to understand that while money may be saved and, and I can't I can speculate as to how much it would be, this sort of other industrial enterprise that would require dismantlement and verification um, would also be uh, expensive as well. Yes, sir. Uh, there, there, there are several interesting uh, points that I would make. Uh, it seems to me that, that there's one of the central problems that's not addressed is understanding uh, how bureaucracies function in terms of the, the, the concepts and the uh, discipline and the idealism that they generate uh, within them that uh, keeps people uh, on the inside from being aware and really reacting to uh, the kinds of sanity that we're trying to bring from the outside. And if you talk to people in the weapons laboratories, uh, some of them feel that they uh, are operating from a very idealistic point of view, that they're increasing the security of the United States. Uh, and it's important, I think, to try to understand, uh, because if we're ever to dismantle this uh, enormous bureaucracy that has so many powerful uh, allies, we have to understand the motivation of the people who work in it, some of whom are uh, uh, mistakenly by our viewpoint, but. Uh, working from an inner logic that makes sense once you enter that bureaucracy. And I think all of us need to think of our associations uh, with universities, with religious groups, uh, businesses, and how we buy in explicitly and implicitly when we join those organizations, the set of core beliefs that govern those organizations, many of which are often not uh, explicitly articulated, but become uh, the understanding uh, principles that uh, guide and set the whole uh, the direction of those organizations. The military bureaucracy is founded on a set of core beliefs that are highly idealistic in many cases. Now, they're corrupted by all sorts of things, and often they lead to unfathomable uh, uh, insanities. Uh, we haven't talked today about the move on the part of the military and industrial uh, congressional science complex to put weapons in space which we can immediately uh, reject uh, based on, on the uh, instabilities that we see now in the ability to exchange weapons on mass scale in minutes as one further step in the insanity that exists. And yet that has some kind of logic to these people that we need to understand. And I think we need to begin to try to uh, look at the motivational aspects of this if we're ever to be successful in beginning to dismantle from the inside some of these organizations. Do you have a question? Or, I'm sorry. Did you have a question you wanted to direct at someone? I'm sorry, I didn't mean. Oh to no, it's okay. I just wanted to add. Frame it as a question. What <laughs> thinking goes on uh, in a, a social context and a cultural context of, of uh, trying to address uh, these issues that keep the cohesiveness and the momentum going on the inside? I, I think this is a medical problem. Um, frankly, uh, uh, and, and, and actually the, the psychiatrists in our organization have spent a fair amount of time trying to look at this. I mean, basically, I, I think that the, the core problem here is that at a different time in human history, having large weapons, uh, good weapons, made you more secure. Uh, if, and, and this is very deeply ingrained in our psychology. I mean, there are studies that if, if two people are walking down the street at night uh, on a dark street um, and um, they see each other approaching, they can't see who the other person is, the first thing they do is size up how big the other person is. 
because if it's a bigger person, then they're afraid, and if it's a small person, they're not afraid. And that kind of got generalized to weapons. If you've got a big stick, you're safer than the guy who's trying to fight you with a little stick. The problem is that, that the modern weapons that we have developed um, have totally uh, turned that logic inside out. It doesn't make any difference how big your nuclear arsenal is. It doesn't make you safe if the other person has any nuclear weapons at all. Um, and we can't seem to get that piece of, of, uh, into our thinking. Um, Jonathan used the phrase, which I, I have tried to champion for, for three decades at this point, the, enemy, the weapons are the enemy. And I think that that's what we need to start having, what we need to try to have people understand, that, in, that when you were talking about nuclear weapons, it, even if you concede, which I don't necessarily, that we're the good guys, you're the bad guys, us having lots of big nuclear weapons does not increase our security at all. It decreases it if the price we pay for having those weapons is they're having them. Um, you know, some of our military leaders, General Butler has said very explicitly, there's only one thing from which the United States military cannot protect us, and that is nuclear weapons. And, you see, this, and is the whole, this is the whole problem. <coughs> this is the logic that I ascribe to and I believe completely. But, but the challenge is why that logic is so opaque for the people on the inside. Well, because it's not logic is the problem. Um, th this is not logic. Um, uh, uh, this doesn't, if you look at this closely, it makes no sense logically. This is sort of a deeply ingrained behavioral pattern that we have, which is why I said it's a medical issue, a deeply ingrained behavioral pattern that we have probably even in our genes at this point from millennia of, of, of trying to be more secure by being stronger. And so it, it, it's very, very hard. It doesn't mean that it's not amenable to logical analysis, but it means that it's a lot harder to change than just having people understand they've got the data wrong. Um, this is a very deeply ingrained behavioral pattern that we have to get people to change. And it's tough. Um, we all tend to, to, to share this kind of thinking to some degree. You know, Einstein's famous quote, Nothing is, everything has changed except the way we think about it. Okay, Can thank I, you. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like a, to add a couple things to it. Um, one of the things I've met when I um, you know, talk to people inside the military about this is that they are, it's not at all sort of a, Sort of a single mass of people, uh, obviously that think in one way. It's it's a it's it's a dynamic part of society where people are thinking ups and downs, uh, left and right about these issues. And there are some also some very bright people there that question many of these things. Um, and I mean, there are several examples of it. Some some questioning of it can come from the fact that someone in one end of the military apparatus has to fulfill his or her mission, and they are. They see that the nuclear gang or the nuclear priesthood or whatever you should call it um, is disturbing that. Um, and one example I'll give here is, for example, the, the deployment of nuclear weapons in Europe. We still have about 200 weapons over there. And that's much less than we had during the Cold War. Uh, and so people tend to you know, compare in that way and they say, oh, okay, therefore things are not as bad. But for the, for the planners on the ground, it's a huge problem because they're asked to um, designate their forces uh, for conventional mission to all sorts of things that happen every single day. It may be, you know, something in Afghanistan, uh, in, in, in Iraq, it may be border patrol, uh, you know, on the, east, on the eastern side of, of NATO, or what have you. But they have real operations they need to do. And the nukes are a burden to that because at the same time, their unit have, has to uh, maintain proficiency. They have to go through the training, which takes weeks and weeks and months and months out of the year. Uh, they have to spend uh, particular facilities where they set aside to storing this stuff. They get inspection, no, no notice inspections all the time. This is a burden to them. So you, you, you will also meet inside that there are people who say, uh, we, we just don't get it. Why do we need to have this? I mean, even Jim Jones, who's the president's national security advisor right now, he used to be the top person uh, for U.S. military forces in Europe. And uh, he was actually on record of saying that he would prefer those weapons would just go back to the United States because they, they're a burden. They don't accomplish anything. So there's, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of views, in my experience, uh, on this inside. Um, one person uh, that was the commander of U.S. Strategic Command um, when he left uh, a few years back, uh, they go through sort of an exit interview. He touched upon another aspect of it, which is about in the guidance that comes from the president, 
to the Secretary of Defense, down the chain of command, and eventually ends up at strategic command. And someone takes it and goes down in the basement to where the guys are sitting to put the X on the map and figure out how many weapons do we need and, and all that stuff. In that process, he said that the president's paper to him describing what he wanted STRATCOM to do on the nuclear stuff was a page and a half. By the time it had made it across the Secretary of Defense table, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, J5 out at STRATCOM, and it got to the war planners, it was 26 pages saying, here's what the president meant to say. <laughs> so there, there is all that happening at all these different levels. And so it comes back to leadership, in my view, uh, assertive leadership, clear thinking and following up on, on what is this uh, following through on it. Because once you leave it to the bureaucratic system, those elements of it that, that want to protect their own little turf will do that and they're very good at it. So. Thank you. Um, we are actually out of time. If, oh, okay. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Yes, please. I, I had a question for uh, Nick or Hans about uh, increasing the U.S. capacity to build nuclear weapons. Um, don't we, as the United States, when we look uh, from an intelligence point of view or a war planning point of view with other countries, use as our primary indicator their capacity, not what they say or what they promise, but what they actually have the capacity? And isn't this another case of U.S. exceptionalism and in, uh, in um, having other countries wanting them to judge us by what we say and not by what you know, we are capable of? I can certainly say something about it. Uh, I call the nuclear posture review, as, uh, or I call even the Obama administration's nuclear policy a schizophrenic policy. You know, because it is on the one hand, it's a policy that, that says that the goal is elimination. It's very important. We're going to take practical step. You know, the whole world come with us. We're going to talk to everybody. On the other hand, it's going to say, all right, uh, it might not happen very quickly. So let's just start building new strategic delivery platforms and new uh, bomb production facilities. You know, how's that going to go down? I, I think it's going to be a very confusing message. Um, so I, I fear there will be a lot of very disillusioned people uh, uh, at the end of this. Uh, the, the huge challenge will be for them to somehow come out and clearly signal which one of those two is the emphasis. I mean, the United States have had on its policy agenda the elimination of nuclear weapons for many decades. I mean, that's been our policy no matter what administration has been there, perhaps minus the, the latest Bush administration. But other than that, that has been the policy. So that in itself is not new. Uh, the question is how are you going to get there? And if what you do says one thing, and you try, and that's important, and all that's not, not to diminish that part of the, the effort, but if the other part says, we're going to continue to modernize this uh, and, and maintain a strong second to none uh, nuclear capability. That's exactly, as you say, what the other adversaries will look at. So we're not going to get the Russians' attention on this uh, to go further down the road or the Chinese' attention to go further down the road unless we somehow come out and construct our nuclear policy uh, in such a way that it clearly shows that uh, maintaining nuclear forces is not the priority. So that's where I would take it. I, I, would, uh, or, Go ahead. Uh, I would just also add that one of the problems with the new bomb production plants in, in the policy of the responsive infrastructure is that the uh, ideology behind it has been framed in such a way that they, they argue that it's consistent, that those who support it argue that it's consistent with Article 6 and disarmament um, in, in a couple of different ways. One is that uh, maintaining safety, security, safety and security and reliability of the stockpile for whatever reason they think becomes more, uh, becomes more important and therefore needs more money and production facilities um, as the stockpile gets lower. There's also a certain logic uh, or, or that's being, well, I wouldn't call it logic, but um, arguments being put out that um, as you're taking, uh, removing weapons um, from the active stockpile, uh, this responsive infrastructure um, will act as an incentive to drive further reductions. Um, it's this sort of, this, this lot, and, and the responsive in infrastructure concept um, actually originated with Jonathan Schell, um, or at least um, that's the first place that I saw it was Jonathan Schell and the abolition in the, in the 80s, um, and then was also used um, as a way of rationalizing 
um, or in the in the context of a de-learning debate in the 90s. Um, the first time it was really implemented in a in a uh, presidential policy was by the Bush administration in 2002, and in that context, it was not about Article 6. Um, it was about uh, ramping up production capability, and they actually had a much larger plan for production facilities than uh, is that, that's currently being put out. There was so much pushback from the sort of production uh, increase that by the end of the Bush administration, this this uh, the theory had evolved that the response of infrastructure, and you can see it in the NPT review conference statements by the United States uh, towards the end of the Bush administration, was actually consistent. Uh, new nuclear warheads with new designs was consistent with Article 6, as was production facilities. So I think that's part of it also, is, um, is, is not just the hypocrisy, but the uh, rationalizing that there, there's merit to these things in a disarming world. Thank you. Was, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question directed to Dr. Hilton. I, I think I got the point about the climate consequences being especially dire in the last decade and so forth. But why don't you, or if you speculate on why we didn't see greater consequences of all the open air testing from the 1950s on well, climate? Yeah, because those, those bombs, fortunately, weren't set off over cities. The, the consequence comes from the burning of the cities that's caused by the use of the weapons. <coughs> Excuse me. If you just blow up a bomb in the middle of the desert, even if it's above ground, you get a certain amount of stuff that gets dispersed into the air. But the real large uh, quantities of, of particulate de matter come from the firestorms um, that burn cities and the huge amount of soot that's generated by those. Those firestorms, I just want to add, ironically, one person discovered, I, what's in, her name, uh, uh, Professor Lin out at uh, Stanford University, wrote a, a very interesting book just a few years ago. Uh, something about, uh, well, the conclusion of the book was that in the planning for strategic nuclear warfare and the effects on, you know, the other side we did during the Cold War, the firestorms were not included in the, uh, in, in, the in, in the calculations of what the effects would be. I mean, totally ignored. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Good question. Talk to us a little bit about how difficult it is to get the information that you're getting and committing to us today. Under so, freedom of information laws um, and finding a difference there between uh, the past administration and the new administration. Yeah. Um, I'd say that, um, well, first of all, you know, it is, it, it's almost like you never know what you're going to get until you see it, of course, and, and you shouldn't always you shouldn't always sort of say, oh, this document looks very interesting, but I think it's going to be classified or, or something like that, and then not bother. I mean, I, I always, but if I see something, and no matter what it is, I, I request it. And sometimes you're lucky. And, uh, and other times you find things in other documents that you just had no idea would, would, would be there or you could probably not get if you ask for that information directly. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a mixed bag. And, and, and the whole point of this, uh, system, the, the, the processing of requests for access to information, in my experience, is that it has more to do, you know, within the reason, but it has more to do with the individuals who are sitting processing the request than it has to do with who is in power, what is the law. Uh, it's very much down to, um, I mean, there is, a, there is a gray zone between what is really classified and what the public has access to or knows about. That whole gray area there, that's where the officers that are going through the, the requests, they have to assess when they open a page and they read through the information what's classified and what's not. There can be a particular uh, weapon system description that under the law should be classified, but, well, that weapon system is no longer deployed, we've retired it, so it no longer needs to be uh, classified. Um, it could be something where there is technically a need to, to do it, but you also say there's a greater uh, public need to be informed about this, so it's actually legitimate to uh, release some information that otherwise would not be released. So there are all these assessments and, you know, uh, human judgment calls, I'd say, that, that really happening. And I think that's, in my experience, much more uh, what's determining uh, what you actually get. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Okay, we're going to take a break for lunch now. Um, we'll take about an hour. There is a table outside for you. Um, there's box lunches with sandwiches and juice and water. Um, and feel free to walk around the school and take a look. Our library is open as well. 
Um, enjoy your lunch. We'll see you back here about 1.15.